I want to share with you a little bit about Florence Wald. Um, she was an internationally recognized pioneer in improving care of the dying patients across the world. The Florence Shorsky Wald Lectureship was established by Derry Ann Moritz and Charles Shepard with the intentions of, and this was their purpose statement, providing a public forum for hearing a noted scholar in palliative care, hospice, end of life care, and for drawing together faculty and care providers throughout the community to reflect on the care of persons who are dying." End of quote. Wald organized an interdisciplinary team and opened the first hospice in the United States in 1971. 37 years later, at her death, there were over 4,700 hospices in the country. Wald built her vision on an unwavering commitment to social justice and reverence for life. She invited patient, family, and team participation and truly listened to their input. Wald was gracious in her hospitality and generous in her compassion. She combined a keen intellect with a deep humanism to conduct research on the needs of the dying in our country. Her ability to enter the world of the terminally ill helped her steer the growth of this first hospice in New Haven, Connecticut, and later contribute to an international level in the reform movement. Florence Wald was a visionary leader in nursing and demonstrated courage and perseverance in forging this new frontier in palliative care in the United States. And we continue her legacy today. I also wanted to take a moment, well, Susan did mention that we are videotaping this, and there is a photo video release at your um, table. If you could please take a moment to fill that out and leave it at, at the registration desk as, as you leave, that will keep us all, um, all legal. So <clears throat> I want to introduce my good friend, Dr. Jeff Cohn. He brings to common practice his deep experience in direct care for patients and ensuring that on an organizational level, health systems have the processes and policies in place to continually improve quality throughout their operations. Jeff works directly with clients on the use of common practice tools and with the common practice design team on the development of new tools that support improved communication and effective decision making in healthcare. Jeff is a longtime change agent and student of behavior change. He is particularly drawn to the solutions like the positive deviance framework, which helps communities solve complex and tractable problems by identifying and building on what works. Jeff graduated from Jefferson Medical College and did his internal medicine residency at Einstein Medical Center and his fellowship in hematology, medical oncology at Emory and John Hopkins University. He received a master's in healthcare management from the Harvard School of Public Health. For 11 years, Jeff was chief quality officer and patient safety officer for Einstein Healthcare Network in Philadelphia. He also served as chief of hematology at Einstein and spearheaded the creation of the palliative care program at Einstein. Most recently, Jeff was president and CEO of Plexus, a nonprofit uh, group focusing on improving health of communities and organizations by using innovative methods focusing on the sociocultural aspects of change. Please help me welcome Jeff Cohn. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, give me one second to change these slides. Um, so I used to uh, call this talk making the difficult conversation simple. And then I realized even with the kind of approaches that we're going to be talking about, there's nothing about end of life that's really simple. But I think that we'll find some ways to make it simpler, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. And um, before getting started, I was sitting before, um, before coming up here with Mary Ann Bow, uh, having a conversation and saying that I'm going to include a bunch of stories in, uh, in the presentation today. And there's one story that I hadn't thought to include, but I think I will just because it tells you something about me that um, helps me think about how I got to this place right now. So when I was in med school, I had gone to med school thinking I was going to be a psychiatrist. And I kept that in my head until I started meeting psychiatrists. <laughs> 
Um, so I started looking around for something else, and the, my experience as a third year student on internal medicine was great. I really liked talking to patients. That's, I guess, what had attracted me to psychiatry, and we did a lot of that on the internal medicine rotation, but it was a rotation as a fourth year student that really framed what I needed to do professionally uh, very clearly to me. And it was uh, an internal medicine rotation at a suburban Philadelphia hospital. And the first day of the rotation, I had a patient admitted to my service who reminded me of my 80-some-year-old grandmother. Her looks, um, her personality, she had a great sense of humor. She had this Afro hairstyle, even though she was a Jewish suburban grandmother. Um, but what made her look very different than my grandmother was she was yellow. And the reason she was yellow was because she had what at that point had not yet been diagnosed, but which we quickly did diagnose an advanced, untreatable pancreatic cancer. Um, she remained in the hospital for almost the entire month of my rotation, and all we could do was diagnose her and then treat her symptoms. Um, for whatever reason, even though she was on the service of a well-known gastroenterologist, the family bonded with me, and every day when they came to the hospital for their update, they paged me, and I told them what had transpired. Um, as her liver function got worse, the patient was kind of thrashing around. She wound up hitting her arm on a bed rail and breaking her arm, and we treated that, got her more comfortable with regard to that. And um, the one thing that I do recall very proudly doing was very near the end of this woman's life, I learned from the family that, or maybe it was from one of the nurses, that on that particular day, it was this woman's 60th wedding anniversary. And two or three rooms from hers in the hospital, her husband was there sick and dying from end-stage renal failure and emphysema. Uh, and I said, well, at the very least, we have to get these two people in the same room for a little time, even though she was pretty much in a stupor and he was pretty much in a stupor. So we got her in a wheelchair and moved her into his room. And for about 15 minutes, the two of them came out of their stupor and were able to like be with each other. And then they both kind of faded away and one died the next day and the other the day after that. My rotation ended. Um, two weeks later, I got a package in the mail and it turned out it was from the family of this woman. It was a sweater that they had bought for the dad who had died that they had never gotten to give him. And they said, we wanted you to have it. We appreciated what you did. And here's our address in Hawaii. If you ever <laughs> come to the islands, please look us up. And I, I've lost the address, and I've not ever visited Hawaii. So I didn't take them up on that. But you know, it occurred to me in a case that almost all of my classmates would have said, oh, god, what a depressing case. Here was this family who had such a sense of a appreciation, and I said, wow, even in this setting, maybe especially in the setting of a case like that, you can make a real difference. So that, in hindsight, really helped mold me professionally and kind of started me on the pathway to lead me to where I am now. So. Um, we're going to be doing some things that are familiar to you and some things that are a little different in this conference. And apologize to my friend, the cameraman. I forgot to tell you about what we're going to do just now. So um, 
roll with it. Um, so to, to start, we're going to do something a little different and interactive. So uh, this is a, a little technique called impromptu speed networking. So I'd like everybody to stand <laughs> and find a conversation partner that you don't have conversations all the time with. So if you have to wander a little bit, just pair off. <laughs> Hang on. You guys are quick learners, but just wanted to make sure that what you're talking about or what's on the slide. So, so I, in a short conversation, you're going to talk each for a minute, talk about what big challenge about communication you're dealing with and something you're hoping to get and give from this workshop. So you need to, you need to talk fast, a minute apiece. I'm going to ring this at uh, two minutes, and then um, we're going to do it one more time, and then we'll get my presentation started, OK? So go, a minute apiece. Hang on. OK, that's two minutes. Um, we're going to do this one more time. So find another partner. And you can have the same conversation. You can change it up. Well, that seemed to work OK. Um, if, does anybody feel like they want to share something that they heard themselves say um, that maybe surprised them or that they think everybody else could benefit from? If so, raise your hand. Martha Ording with HealthEast. Um, I was thinking about helping patients understand what's going on for them and trying to help them but also what's going on for families and trying to explain to families that my role is primarily to try to help the patient with their symptoms, but that can't be separated from the family and what they're going through. But trying to help the family with what they're struggling with doesn't always equate with helping the family with what they're, or the patient with what they're struggling with. So trying to bring those two together and balance them, that's what I came up with. Nice. Thank you. Hi, Sheila Skeels from Winona Health Hospice, and I would love to be able to take some tools home and, um, in order to start having these conversations before people are actually Sorry. dying. It would really be a relief to start that up front and in the communities. Nice. One or two others? Anybody? Got one more? Hi, I'm Vicki Rackner, and one of my partners said that she's interested in having the conversation about how to persuade physicians to see things through a different perspective and think about more therapeutic options. Mm. I'm here because I'm interested in having difficult conversations around money. I practice in Washington State. We talked about death with dignity, and it's my concern that maybe some people are going to end their lives to preserve their family financial resources. Wow. OK. All right, well, let's get started. Thank you all. Um, hopefully, we'll at least touch something related to what was brought up, as well as the multiple other conversations that happened. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a story that probably feels familiar to many of you who who, who in the room works in a hospital setting? So the, a good percentage. Um, this is a hospital story. Um, 
a patient that I met when I was helping to get the palliative care program started at my former institution. And one day a resident called with uh, what didn't happen very frequently, a stat palliative care consult. And it was kind of a hair on fire call from the resident. We need to get you here immediately. This patient is stroked out. She's totally uh, unable to communicate and um, the kidney, her kidneys are failing. They're getting ready to put in a dialysis catheter. The family's out of control. They want everything done. And you need to, I got a bottle. I, thank you. Um, you need to get them to be realistic with their goals of care. Um, <laughs> familiar? So um, we'll come back to Ms. Johnson, but I think that um, for many people in the field exemplifies situations that are common. And um, I'm trying to remember, this was, this was a consult that I was filling out with a consult form. I don't remember what I put as the diagnosis, but in hindsight, I've realized that this could have been the diagnosis. I made up this word. <laughs> Uh, hypoconversationosis. Um, and um, the symptoms of hypoconversation in an inadequate number of conversations happening include tension and stress in the patient, in the family, in the clinical team caring for the person. Um, various types of pain, um, the physical pain that the, the patient might be experiencing, which isn't adequately controlled, but also the emotional, emotional and spiritual pain that they and their, their caregivers um, are experiencing, and a lot of confusion about what's going on, what are the options, what are the goals, um, what is realistic, um, and then some other signs that hypoconversationosis is present is expensive care, um, particularly um, in the setting of ASI stands for advanced, or as I refer to it, advancing serious illness, and burn burnout, moral distress of the clinical team. So uh, we're gonna talk about hypoconversationosis. Um, you know, most elderly adults want to have conversations about what's happening to them as they're approaching end of life with their families, with their care teams, I think 90%, but less than two thirds actually are able to accomplish that in a meaningful way. Almost all elderly patients with serious illness want to have a conversation with their physician um, or primary care provider about their wishes. But uh, almost 90% say, you know, the doc has never opened the door for me to have that conversation. The doc has never introduced it or asked about it. So, um, so we've got this huge need and yet they're not taking place. So um, I need my runners again. Um, some ideas from the crowd why these conversations may not be happening. Not comfortable. Okay, people aren't comfortable having them. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I, I think it's just a very uncomfortable place for people to go. They're, they're afraid of what others are gonna think. And I think sometimes we see too that um, the elderly maybe don't want as much treatment as the family might want, but they're afraid of letting the family members down, so they agree to go through with things. So there actually is conflict there. Not enough time. Okay, yeah, time pressure. Not enough training. Not enough training. That's Fear that someone's going to give up hope. Cult, uh, cultural differences. 
that um, the family member um, believes very strongly that it is not um, in their best interest in the long term to allow their parent or their loved one to die on their watch. Mm. The, uh, the healthcare systems don't measure it, and so uh, hemoglobin A1C is measured, but this isn't. Hmm. That's starting to change a little bit, but you're right. Our medical community has not been properly trained on how to have those conversations. All right, so that's a good sampling. We could go on for a while. Um, some others that the literature supports is that, and it goes with um, you know, the patients wanting it, but the physicians not opening the door to it, many patients feel that it is the physician's job to get this conversation started. Um, and as we said, that physicians often may be the most uncomfortable and their lack of training is part of that. Um, some, some people just may not have gotten to the point in their illness or their view of what's going on with their illness to be ready to have this conversation, even though they may be in their final days of life. Uh, earlier upstream, some people, and when I was working, I worked in a pretty financially challenged environment, and many people were like, I have other things I need to worry about, like getting the rent paid or having dinner on the table and you know my own end of life is of secondary importance um, to those more immediate worries. Um, as you guys were saying, it's just difficult, painful. Um, oftentimes the patient wants to have the conversation but the family doesn't and they respect or uh, um, back down based on what the family um, is stating so it doesn't happen. Um, and there's, particularly from the oncology literature, there's this, uh, this body of work that is showing that people, even with very advanced malignancies, may not realize how sick they are and what the goal of treatment is, that they're, they actually do have life-limiting illnesses. They are imagining they're getting treatment for cure. So, um, you know, when we don't have the conversations, even though most people want to die at home, too many of them die in institutions. Not so often anymore the hospitals, or not as often as it once was, but still way more common than what people want. But this kind of experience, sometimes even up until the final hours of life, is, is far too common. Um, and uh, I haven't been a hospice provider, but I know, and I'll be sharing a story of patients who you know, their enrollment on hospice begins with them looking like this and ends an hour or two later when they're withdrawn from this kind of support. So uh, that's what happens far too often. And, um, and we need to do differently and better than this. So the, the group of people that I'm gonna be focusing on with regards to ensuring or enabling more and better conversations to happen are those with what the literature calls advanced serious illness, advanced illness, serious illness, life-limiting disease. Um, the features that uh, these people have in common uh, include them becoming increasingly frail and sick appearing and losing their appetite, losing their energy. And in my past oncology life, we used to say declining performance status, which I thought was a, a actually a pretty good way of capturing what we're talking about. Um, the disease that used to be pretty well controlled maybe for 
years, maybe decades, no longer is easy to control. And consequently, they wind up showing up in the emergency department. They frequently are hospitalized and frequently receive aggressive care um, as their disease is becoming more refractory to standard treatments. And when people enter this pathway of being uh, carrying these symptoms, um, it supposedly indicates that they're in their final six to 24 months of life. There are organizations like uh, CTAC, the Center for the Transformation of Advanced Care, Advanced Illness Care, that really try and lump these patients into a common syndrome. And I think to a certain extent you can. Um, this is uh, a picture of my parents. Um, my mom was diagnosed when I was a second year resident with a fairly un uncommon autoimmune disorder, scleroderma, which has the potential to affect virtually every organ in the body. But for her, she uh, lived kind of in symbiosis with the disease for a long, long period of time. This is a picture of her when she turned 70. And she, I think, looks like a pretty healthy person there. So this is a picture of her at her 80th birthday. And both she and my dad look much older. But to me, um, if you look hard at her, you can see the temporal wasting and other signs of her being much more seriously ill than she was 10 years ago. It turns out this was about nine months before she died. Um, and so she had entered this advancing serious illness pathway. Um, that being said, even though there are similarities of people with multiple types of disease once they get to that stage of the illness, how they got there, and even what happens once they get there is different depending upon what the underlying disorder is. So this is a slide from a, a really good and I think uh, important paper that came out about 10 years ago where people with serious illness were grouped into three different what they called clinical archetypes. The blue line is supposed to represent the cancer patient's trajectory. And the y-axis is how functional, how fit the person is. And the x-axis is time. So the blue line is supposed to indicate that a, a typical cancer patient may, advanced cancer patient, may do well for an extended period of time until their disease breaks through the threshold of what their body is able to control, I guess. And then they have this kind of falling off a cliff trajectory towards the end of life with a pretty steady downhill. The red curve is supposed to uh, represent what they, the authors call organ failure. Heart failure, COPD, would be the commonest, but you could lump uh, end-stage renal and end-stage liver into this pattern, too. And what this shows is a more gradual decline, plus these deeper dips that represent the exacerbations that land patients in the hospital. And when people have, are in the midst of that dip, they can be really sick. I mean, they can be ICU sick, on life support sick, but what happens is they get better and they go back onto the curve to at some future point have another exacerbation and flare up. And then the third, the green curve, represents um, either neurodegenerative disorders, most particularly Alzheimer's, or the, and the frailty of aging. Um, and with either of those, 
people can live for extended periods of time with multiple dependencies, um, frail enough that they could trip over something and break something and have that be their uh, trigger for death tomorrow, but that m might not happen ever and they could live five, 10 years in this low functional state. Um, so what do, uh, oh, and, and just a little bit more about these different archetypes. So in a subsequent paper that came out within the, the last couple of years, these authors write about the, the way that the patient with these archetypes think about their own disease and their own potential mortality. So in the cancer archetype, um, and this feels very real to me, that virtually everybody diagnosed with a cancer, no matter what kind, no matter what stage, no matter how favorable, unfavorable the prognosis, when you hear the word cancer, you at least briefly think to yourself, am I gonna die from this? And then you might shove it in the back of your mind, particularly if it turns out it's a favorable prognosis early stage. But still, if, uh, if you get a recurrence or if you get a new symptom that might be a recurrence, that brief thought, is this the disease again? Does that mean I'm, I'm dying? Death is intertwined with the cancer diagnosis. And then as it becomes clear that the disease is progressing, death moves closer and close to the front of the stage. And so ultimately, as a cancer patient is approaching end of life, um, it's, it's unusual for them to be very surprised that um, that's what this disease is doing to them. And so this is the imagery I have of the, the patient at the end of their cancer experience, that they've fought it and now they're accepting of it and have reached the end. Contrast that with the organ failure patients who they may never recall when they were first told that they had heart failure. Um, and there may be no clear like starting point. It's more a continuum. And eventually you get below a threshold and say, yeah, that I guess meets the criteria. Um, and their course is much less predictable than the cancer patients. They've got these life-threatening episodes that they recover from. And so the idea that they may always be able to recover from these life-threatening episodes is not unreasonable for them to be carrying with them. And, um, and so thinking about their own mortality and thinking about hospice and palliative care seems much more foreign to them because my doc's going to keep coming up with something new to treat my failing heart. Um, and why should we talk about end of life? So this is the image that I have of the patient with, with these disorders. And then finally, in the dementia frailty column, um, I think people, if they're still cognitively capable of being in conversation with you, accept their, uh, their reality. Uh, and it's not their primary concern. They've got other worries that um, are a worse fate than death that they're um, going to use their, um, if they're going to be worried about something, that's what they're going to be worried about more than dying, like becoming even more dependent or losing their ability to speak or walk or something that they consider vital to who they are as a human. And, and, um, and so, um, you know, they know their death is going to happen. I think these folks may be open to hospice and palliative care, sometimes for very extended periods of time, but it may not feel 
that pressing a need for them. Um, and so this is the, the image I have of them, the people that just kind of fade away from their lives. So um, do, do these archetypes make sense for you guys? Um, I'm guessing that your experience with patients does vary based on what their underlying diseases are. Um, any a, a comment or? A little bit of my experience with the ones that are in the physical and cognitive frail group, um, when it gets really severe, you don't really know what's going on. And a lot of times, uh, family members want to keep them going. Uh, and so they are the ones really driving the, um, the course of action. Um, they have things like issues related to peg tube, um, being raised and family pushing for it. And you know, that's kind of my experience with that group. Yeah, I think that is common. And you know, the part of what this framework does for me is it gives me some empathy into what the family might be thinking in a situation like that because you know their family member may have been like this for a long period of time and they may not view what's going on now as being that much different from what was going on a month ago, six months ago and so why wouldn't we want to continue to prolong things um, back here. I think uh, organ failure, uh, heart failure certainly is that. There's always something more you can do. And so long as they're able to breathe, even though they can only walk 10 feet, uh, they feel fine. And so talking to them about your trajectory, how, where have you been? What's going on? I think that's, that's one way to approach it. But there is always something else that'll make you better, even in LVAD. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, I think the the specialists providing the care can contribute to that sense of there's always something to do, even though you might have been in the hospital or in the emergency department every week for the last month, which is very different than what had happened over the last five years with the illness. So, yeah, trying to get them to appreciate that yes, something different is happening, the trajectory has changed, is important. So, I, I mean, I think from the archetype standpoint, I think those are accurate, but I think to recognize the shifting change in the frequency of those archetypes over the last 10 to 20 years has been you know, quite dramatic. So we are seeing a much higher uh, chronic medical illness, if you will, rising along with the neurodegenerative conditions. I think one of the one of the problems we have is that families and, and patients get mixed messages all the time. You know, so what message the primary doc gives versus the specialist versus the person in the skilled nursing facility or post-acute care are varies immensely. And to your point of, well, they may have been in the hospital, even in heart failure, you know, several times, the data would suggest that if they've been in hospitalized more than three times in the last six months, that they're very close to end of life. And so I don't think we, we um, have a unified approach as providers to say, yes, here's, here's what evidence would suggest and, and here's what we need to be talking about. Even if there is something else to do, it doesn't mean that it's an either or conversation, it should be an and conversation. And how do we have that and conversation? Agree completely. One more. Uh, the, the graphs, I've seen this a number of times before, it, it implies that there's a continuous process. And so then the challenge is, so when do you have the conversation in, in that kind of thing? And I think the hospitalization is maybe the default, but not necessarily the best time to do that. The other is the decision points when we're talking about technology. When, when we're doing things or considering things, whether it's the pacemaker or um, the dialysis or something is you know before we start that to have the conversation. So I think in terms of expanding that to have some kind of arrows saying you got to do something at this point. You can't just do that and then talk about end of life after you put in a dialysis catheter. 
agree. And, uh, and so one of the things that I take away from this is first just like I, I was saying, some empathy for the patient, the family, who, you know, they've, the pathway that they've traveled through to get to this point of being in their final six to 24 months is, it's their pathway, and it informs their way of thinking. And even though we as healthcare professionals, looking from this point, to what is likely their end of life, you know, may have a fairly clear vision of what things are going to be like and what's in your best interest, we have to take into account the pathway that they've been on and those beliefs that they've accumulated based on their experiences with their clinical team and their family, et cetera. Um, and I think the conversations that we need to have will vary and how we get into them based on where the person is on the traje trajectory towards end of life. I agree this, this is a model. This isn't the way it actually happens with everybody, but most models are useful sometimes. And uh, this is data that is familiar to all of you, probably in, um, about just in the US, how much healthcare resource we use at the end of life. I put my town, Philadelphia, in here um, just for comparison. So I guess we're a little better than average on people dying in hospital, um, but worse than average in ICU hospitalization during the final stay, which contributes to the 20 plus percent higher total cost per patient over the last six months of life. Um, and it's a big part of why I'm in the work that I'm doing now. I saw too many people in my former institution having their end of life be like this in the ICU, multiple con consultants, despite them having uh, an illness that was clearly in their final stages. Um, so let's shift for a few minutes, um, then we'll take a break. I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about how to create conditions that um, enable good conversations to happen. Um, Psychological safety is a term that was coined by a Harvard researcher, Amy Edmondson, and it's about conditions in which all who are trying to be in a conversation together feel willing and, and com comfortable um, in making themselves vulnerable to the other, speaking things about themselves, about their lives that might make them uncomfortable, and they feel it's important that I share them for the benefit of what we're talking about for the team, the organization, whatever. Um, so it's a, it's a group dynamic, um, and all members need to have this willingness um, and ultimately, hopefully, comfort with making themselves vulnerable. Um, it's important that the group um, have the sense of psychological safety um, feel uh, felt equally from all members. Um, psychological safety is a team concept. Having one person who's a guru at psychological safety and a, oh, I'm comfortable sharing anything about myself. If the people that they're talking with don't feel that way, it's kind of pointless. Everybody has to feel willing and comfortable to um, making themselves vulnerable. And so the group that I work with, Common Practice, has developed a tool for the purpose of uh, creating conditions um, that are psychologically safe for conversation, and it's a game. And why would a game 
be potentially useful for this purpose? Well, there are people who study the science of games and, and why games work, and there are a few things about games that do lend themselves to the framework of psychological safety. One is that games have rules, um, whereas most conversations don't. Um, but when you're having a conversation in a game that has rules, you follow the rules of the conversation as the, the game says you should. Um, so that knowing what you're supposed to do, what you can do and can't, what you're not allowed to, that's a helpful way in uh, establishing boundaries. There's also structures to games. There's a playing field, there's boundaries, physical boundaries, um, the game elements, and those create a sense of a shared experience that also contribute to a sense of we're all kind of experiencing this, doing this together. So that whether you're a teammate of someone playing a game, whether you're playing against them as a competitor, um, there's a sense that people participating in the same game are empathic with each other because they're trying to get to the same goal using the same rules, on the same playing field, using the same tools, and that contributes to a sense of psychological safety. Um, in the game that my colleagues have developed, um, there's a couple of other game elements that contribute to the psychological safety. Taking turns, um, that's uh, different than what happens in most of our conversations where particularly in healthcare, oftentimes it's the healthcare professional who dominates, or the tables get turned and the spotlight gets shown on the patient and they're the ones that are supposed to say all the words. So if it is really a uh, shared experience where we're all gonna have a part where we're supposed to be listening and, and then it's gonna be our turn to actually speak if we choose to, with also the ability to choose not to speak if I elect to, that's uh, also a way of contributing to safety. And then um, while you're listening, looking at the other people that are in the conversation with you and, and sensing what they're expressing from a nonverbal cue standpoint and then doing something about it, even if it's just um, changing your way of speaking to them based on you sensing that they're feeling sad or they're feeling particularly vulnerable based on their body language, or even stating it, boy, it looks like that was a hard thing for you to say, that contributes to a broader sense of psychological safety. So uh, any questions? We're at the end of this first part of the workshop. Um, questions right now? We're going to take a short break and then come back and have a a different kind of experience for some of you together.